Hello. So this week, before I go into the readings for the week, a number of you did send me questions about content, either from the video post or from the readings. And so I chose one of those to answer now as the question of the week. Anything you don't understand from the readings or the lectures, it's a good thing to ask a question about. The best questions are not the most complicated questions, but the ones that are the most useful for me to answer in helping you understand better what's going on. Sometimes the readings, or even me in the lectures, may presuppose that you understand something, have a handle on a concept that you don't. Ask questions about these things. So this week's question comes from Mera, and the question is whether I could explain ontology more fully. Yes, I can but I'll actually do that also. So, philosophy is generally thought to be divided into four parts. You have epistemology, the study of knowing, how we know things, the difference between a truth, a mere belief, knowledge, so forth. There's logic, there's value theory, this includes aesthetics, the study of the beautiful, and also ethics and morality, the study of the good, and the study of the right. And then finally, we have metaphysics. Metaphysics is itself divided into two parts, cosmology, the study of causes, the study of causation, explanations for the existence of things, the world, etc., and ontology, which is the study of being, the nature of being. Now, all of these are going to be of interest to us to some degree. For the most part, ontology and epistemology are going to be the ones we're concerned with. Logic comes in, but we're not going to discuss the logic of the mental or the logic of the physical that much, though you did see it in the section from Smart. He talks about mind and body having different logics connected to them. Value theory is not something we're really going to talk about, though it does come into play when we talk about methodology. Uh, we see it again in Smart when he talks about parsimony and simplicity. Those are values. Values had values we want our theories to have. But for us, we're mostly concerned with epistemology, how we go about knowing about minds, knowing about body, and metaphysics. We're interested in the cosmological question, the nature of mind-body interaction, but primarily, we're concerned with the ontological question, and that is because what we say about the cosmological question, how mind and body interact, depends on what we say about the nature of the mind and the nature of the body. Now, to talk specifically about ontology, ontology concerns everything that exists and the nature of those things. So we can say that someone has an, an ontology, which is just a list of things they believe exist. Now, we talk about different ontologies. Usually we're not interested in the fact that maybe my list of things that exist and your list of things that exist differ in some place. You know, we list everything that exists. This, of course, is ideal, an infinite number of things, but if we did list that exhaustive list of things that exist, that is the ontological account of the world, there might be something on my list that's not on your list. That's likely true of everyone's ontology. But when we talk about different ontologies, Usually we're interested in big differences, specifically the difference between a monist ontology and a dualist ontology. They might list different specific things on their lists of what exists. They might have different details about the nature of those things, but there are also very big differences. Um, monism says that of the list of things that exist, there's only one kind of thing. They might say that all there are ideals are the mental, 
the kind of monism that we're not really going to talk about idealism, the doctrine that all that exists are mental properties. Um, and the reason we don't talk about it is it doesn't affect current discussions of mind-body that much. It was a hot topic in modern philosophy, 18th century. It's largely fallen out of favor in order to get around or to argue against idealism or move past idealism. You have to establish the real existence of the world. That's a different sort of thing than we're dealing with here. So usually when we talk about monism, when we talk about monism in this class, we're talking about a list of things that exist, and everything in the list is under a type, physical. Dualism, on the other hand, says, well, look, on our ontology, even if all the specific things are the same as the monist, the physicalist ontology, there's two different kinds of things. There are the physical things and there are the mental things. So in our list of what exists, there are two different categories of things. We could actually have three categories there, and that might actually be Descartes' real position, where God has its own category. But when we talk about ontology, we talk about the things that exist and the nature of those things. Their specific properties, their category properties, are they physical, are they mental, are they in different categories from one another? And so when I asked about the ontological question last week, is the claim about whether there is a category in the list of things that exist that is mental. Are there mental things? That's an ontological claim. Or no, there are only physical things. Again, that's an ontological claim. And that's going to be, well, not distinct from, but a different question from the epistemological question of how we go about knowing mind and body. We say that mental and physical are different things, ontologically different things, that might impact the way we go about studying mind and body. Right? And so the claim about causation, that there is causal interaction, as a cosmological claim, it became a big deal for Descartes because he made this claim that there are two different kinds of things. There's the mental and there's the physical. If we say there's only physical, the cosmological question is not as big of a question because it seems we understand physical causation. So, thank you, Mira. That's my answer to the question of the week. And now, I'm going to move on to the readings. And I won't treat all the points in the readings, but try to make identity theory uh, more clear. Explain exactly what we're concerned with. All the readings is to concern themselves with identity theory. Identity theory is motivated by, well, the fact that if we say the mental and the physical are different substances, then we have a causal problem, a cosmological problem. This is the causal interaction problem that Descartes faced. If we say that, no, there are only physical things, okay, how do they interact? Well, the easiest way to answer that question is to say, well, they are just the same thing. Mind just is body. They are identical. So identical identity theorists say that mind and body are identical. There are two different kinds of identity theory. There's type identity theory and token identity theory. Type identity theory is the stronger claim. It's the more useful claim because what we want to be able to do is give a way of studying the mental. And if the type of thing, mental events, are identical to the type of thing, physical events, then by studying physical events, we can study mental events, and we can construct laws on those things in order to run explanations, construct hypotheses, make predictions. If a specific instance of pain, say a mental event, is identical to a specific instance of C-fiber firing in my body, C-fibers are a certain kind of nerve, and oftentimes it says pain is identical to C-fiber firing, but if we say that, one specific token instance of a pain is identical to one specific token instance of C-fiber firing, that's an identity theory claim, but it's not going to be able to underwrite laws about mind-body interaction, and so we're still going to have, to have a problem about how to investigate, explain, predict mental behaviors by investigating physical behaviors. So, all the readings this week were primarily concerned with type identity theory, which says the type of thing, 
and then you name a mental property is identical to the type of thing, and then you name a physical property. So pain, in general, as a type, is identical to C fiber firing as a type. My specific pain here now, in my foot, say, is not identical to, say, a future pain in my hand. They're different tokens of pain, and they're associated with different C fibers firing. Nonetheless, the entire group of things, pain, is identical to the entire group of things, C fiber firing, as a type. Now, the key here to identity theory is the identity claim itself. So we have to understand identity, and I've mentioned this before. Strict identity is generally associated with Leibniz. Leibniz's law, which says for any two things, if thing A has a property that thing B does not have, then A and B are not identical. So if A and B are identical, a does not have any property B does not have. B does not have any property A does not have. They share all their properties in common, which means they share their spatial location in common. They share their temporal location in common. That is, they're really only one thing. Now, if we say that mind just is body, we're saying that mind and body are one thing, which means that there's no property of mind not had by body. There's no property of body not had by mind. That's the claim of the identity theorist. And this also means that there's a very clear way to object or argue against identity theory. That is to say, but hey, there is some property of mind not had by body, or there is some property of body not had by mind. Right? And we've seen this a couple times. Descartes claimed mind is unextended, mind is immaterial, mind is thinking, and body is not. We saw with the property dualist that the property of being intentional directed at something was a property had by the mind, not had by the body. I'm going to put those aside, assume that there are responses to those, and look at other objections to identity theory. So the reading from Smart, he does not really lay out identity theory. He doesn't explain identity theory. He doesn't argue for it. Rather, what he does is defend it against these sort of obvious objections. Now, of his objections, the first three are the most interesting, and they're also essentially restatements of one another. So I'm going to focus on the first three objections. And so he talks at times about lightning and certain electrical discharges, and he says lightning, the type of thing lightning, just is identical to the type of thing of electrical discharge of a certain sort. You cannot have that lightning or any given lightning without having a given electrical discharge. You cannot have an electrical discharge of that sort without having lightning. Later, Kripke talks about heat and molecular motion. You can't have heat without having molecular motion. You can't have molecular motion without having heat. Now, remember, these are claims about the type of thing heat, the type of thing molecular motion. It may be the case that this heat here, heat 1, is different from heat 2 because heat 1 is hotter than heat 2. Okay? In which case, there's more molecular motion in heat 1 than in heat 2, or in case 1 than in case 2. That's fine. Heat 1 is identical in that case, to a certain level of molecular motion. Heat 2 is identical to a different level of molecular motion. Nonetheless, heat in general is identical to molecular motion. And now, Smart and Kripke think that these are non-troubling cases, that it is the case that identity holds here. Now, there's the question of whether we really think there to be identity to hold here, but they both grant it. And generally, these are non-controversial positions that heat is identical to molecular motion. Lightning is identical to electrical discharge of a certain sort. And then the question is, well, is this true of mind and body? If we think that mind and body are identical in some sense, do we think that it's in this sense? Is the identity between mind and body the same as the identity between heat and molecular motion? And then Smart says, well, but there is an objection 
the objection is the obvious sort that says, but there is some property had by mind, not had by body. And then there are different ways of stating this, or different candidates for this difference. And one is that, well, there's a qualitative experience had to, say, seeing red that is not had by the brain state itself. Or, I can know what it's like to see red without knowing anything about neurology, and therefore without knowing anything about my brain state. But how could I know about red or experience red without experiencing my brain state or knowing about my brain state? It seems there's a property had by red, the fact that I know it, the fact that I experience it, not had by body, the fact that I don't know my brain state, I don't experience my brain state. So there is some property had by the mind or mental properties, not had by body or physical properties. If that's the case, then they're not identical. And so those first three objections are all varieties of that same sort of thing, that same sort of line of reasoning. And so he responds to that. And the way he does that is by saying that, well, without saying in these terms, we have to understand that there are ways to know about something that are not, don't, don't change the properties of those things. And so we need to talk about the referent of a term and or the extension of the term and the sense of a term or the intention of the term. And here we have to be careful. Intention is with an S, and so we say intentional here is not the intentional we saw earlier. Intentional that we saw previously was that it was directed at something in the world. Intentional here means it depends on the way you think of it or the way you know about it. And so terms have both a referent or an extension. A referent is a thing in the world that's picked out by the term. An extension is the group of things picked out by the term. Terms also have senses, things they're associated with, thoughts they bring up to you. And so he gives examples, Smart does at times. We see examples in the reading that, look, there's the morning star and the evening star. The morning star, at one point people thought there was a morning star. The morning star was the first star you see in the morning. There's also an evening star. Evening star, oh, no. Morning star is the last star you see in the morning. Evening star is the first star you see in the evening. They thought that these were different things. They referred to different things in the world, and they had different thoughts about them. For example, I see the evening star before I go to bed. I see the morning star after I wake up. Those are different ideas associated with evening star and morning star. But then at some point, our science advanced, and we found out that the evening star and the morning star were not different things at all. In fact, they're both Venus. They're not stars, they're Venus. The first thing that appears to be a star at night is not a star at all, it is Venus. The last thing that appears to be a star in the morning is not a star at all, it is Venus. So, morning star and evening star, contrary to what they thought before, did not refer to two different things. It, they both, both the terms picked out a single thing in the world, Venus. Nonetheless, they had different senses associated with them. And Smart at one point talks about slugger beds, people who sleep in really late had never experienced the morning star. They would make certain statements about the evening star, say, I know what the evening star is, say, and they would not say things about the morning star. They would say different things about the morning star, like, I don't know what the morning star is. But if that's true, it seems that there are properties had by the evening star, not had by the morning star, that is, that slugabouts know about the evening star, they do not know about the morning star. There are different properties to these two things, and they're not identical, but if that's the case, we're saying Venus is not identical to itself, which does not seem right at all. The distinction here is that when we're talking about identity, we're talking about the things in the world, the reference, the thing picked out by the term, or the extension, the group of things picked out by the term, and with type identity theory, we're concerned with the group of things, pain, say, and the group of things, C-fiber, firing. 
In terms also of a sense, ideas they're associated with, ways we go about thinking about them, these give them intentional properties. And when we're concerned with identity, we're concerned with reference, the thing in the world, we're concerned with their extension, the things the terms refer to, not their intentions, the way we go about thinking about them. So when we check for identity, we're concerned with extensional properties, not intentional properties. To say that two things have different intentional properties is not to make any claim against identity. It's not to say that there are two things there at all, because at one point it was thought there was an evening star, there was a morning star. These are two different things. These depended on the way of thinking about them, not about the things in the world. And now there are other examples here that might be useful. At one point he talks about Superman and Clark Kent. I think that's not a good case. At another time they talk about he, um, H2O and water. I think that's also not a good case. We can talk about Samuel Clemens and Mark Twain because they are the same person. That is, Mark Twain is the pen name of Samuel Clemens. But as a matter of fact, my fiance is the most beautiful woman in the world. A couple things are worth noting here. One, you could know something about the most beautiful woman in the world. Say you read an article about her, found out that she is five foot six, without knowing that my fiance is five foot six. I could introduce you to my fiance, and you would know my fiance without knowing that she's the most beautiful woman in the world. And so this puts you in a situation where you would say certain things. I know Robert's fiance. I do not know the most beautiful woman in the world, seem to have different properties being known by you, but again, these are intentional properties. The phrase, the most beautiful woman in the world, and the phrase, Robert's fiance, pick out the same thing in the world, the same referent. I'm going to give you this example to hold on to because I'm going to come back to it when we get to Kripke. Now, Smart says the fact that we can know that we experience red without knowing that we're having a certain brain state, or we can understand red without under, or we can understand the experience of having seen red without understanding or having an experience of that brain state. These are intentional cases. They depend on the way we think about them, the things we know about them. Right? And since they're intentional cases, they do not impact the identity claim at all. There are two different ways to go about thinking of the same thing. Just like we might have thought before, someone says evening start to me, that brings up in my head a thought of nighttime. Morning start brings up in my head a thought of the morning. Different ways of thinking about them, not different properties of Venus. Venus has both properties of being present at night and being present in the morning. Smart's claim is that all these sorts of objections that purport to say, but there is some property of the mental not had by the physical, they make this mistake. They confuse intention and extension. So even though there is a difference here, the difference is one of the way we think about them, not about them themselves. If we do believe that heat is molecular motion, well, at one point we knew about heat and its properties, and this should not be confused with the experience of heat, that is feeling something hot. Rather, heat has effects on the world, making things expand, make water evaporate more quickly, these sorts of things. We knew this about heat before we knew anything about molecules. And yet, heat just is molecular motion. And so those are the three first objections, the most interesting objections in SMART. He says, look, people who argue against identity theory, they think they have a counter case, a counter case in which they say mind has some property, body does not, and therefore mind and body are not identical. But they're wrong because they confuse intention and extension. 
after he makes his objections, he makes an interesting claim, another important claim at the end there. And he says, if we assume that Cartesian, Cartesian dualism is out of play, say because the causal interaction problem is too big of a problem for substance dualism. Get rid of that. What other options do we have? We have materialism to say that there is just material stuff, the physical, epiphenomenalism. Epiphenomenalism says there's physical, there's mental, but the mental doesn't really affect the physical at all. It's something like an afterimage, it's a shadow, it's a reflection. He said, well, how can we adjudicate between those two claims? Which one of those is right? How can we tell whether the epiphenomenalist is right or the materialist is right? And he says, well, some will say that it's a scientific question, an empirical question. And he says, no, this is not true because there's no way to tell empirically the difference between the two. There's no way to construct a test because everything we observe in terms of the physical would be exactly the same. And then he gives an example. Sometimes creationists will say, well, the world is only 4,000 years old. And yes, there are carbon dating techniques to say that the world is older, and yes, there are layers of rock, strata, that make it appear as if the world is older, and yes, there are fossils which seem to be older than 4,000 years old, but in reality, the world is 4,000 years old, but God made it appear just as if it weren't. In fact, God made it appear just as if it were the way physics and biology would tell us, complete with evolution and a big, big bang. Now, how do we adjudicate between those two claims that what we have in the world is a, is a result of the Big Bang and evolution, or the claim that what we have in the world is a result of God's creation 4,000 years ago, but made to look like it's the result of the Big Bang and evolution? Well, because in the second case, it's made to look just as if the first case were true. There's no experiment we could do to tell the difference between the two. And the reason he says it's not an empirical question at all, not a scientific question at all, is not only that there's no scientific test of it, but the scientists would not bother with that at all. And the reason for that, he says, is that the epiphenomenalist case, this creationist story with the trickster god case, make it appear as if they're giving an explanation, a good explanation, but these explanations uh, violate rules of logic, he says, though we might think they're rules of science, that explanations should be simple and parsimonious. They should not be more complicated than is needed to explain what's at hand. At one point, he mentions Occam's razor. Occam's razor says that we ought not multiply entities beyond what is needed for the sake of explanation. So the two explanations, in the creationist case, in the evolutionist case, the scientific case says Big Bang and evolution. That explains what we see. The creationist case says Big Bang, evolution, God, and God's a trickster. We have four things versus two things here, more entities to explain the exact same thing. The epiphenomenalist case, we have only the physical. We have the physical and the mental, but everything we see is just as if they're the same. Both cases are the same. So in the two cases, in the epiphenomenalist case versus the materialist case, in the trickster god case versus the evolution physics case, we have more complicated explanations. Smart says that these, as a matter of logic, we can get rid of those. Now, I did mention it as a value theory because it depends on what we take to be the value, whether we think parsimony is a logical matter, whether things ought to be parsimonious and simple, or whether that's something that we would like them to be. If it's something we would like them to be, is it something we would like of our scientific theories? Is it something required of scientific theories? These are questions for us to ask. But what we're noticing, as he says, if Cartesian dualism is out of play, then the question seems to be between materialism and epiphenomenalism. We get rid of epiphenomenalism on either logical, so he says, or scientific grounds because it's too complicated. It explains no more than the materialist case does, but it has more ontological entities, ontological claims to make the same explanations and predictions. 
So we can get rid of that too. At one point he talks about nomological danglers. And the idea we saw with the property dualists, they said, well, if you gave a complete physical account of the world, there's still something you have to explain, namely the mental things. Those mental things can't be reduced to the physical things. And Smart says, well, if this is the case, we can give laws about physical things. And if we could reduce the mental things, that is, translate all mental talk into physical talk, if we could do that, then we could get laws of the mental things, too. If there's some mental property we can't reduce to a physical property, some way of talking about the mental that can't be reduced to a way of talking about the physical, then there's a nomological dangler. There's something for which we cannot give a scientific law. This, he says, is objectionable. So one, there's the question of whether it is objectionable. It seems if our goal is to understand mind, then yes, that is the case. If we want to give an account of mind, if we want to give an account of mind by way of body, we need a theory of mind, a theory of body, a theory of the relationship between the two that gets rid of any unexplained mental properties. Otherwise, we're something like Mysterians. We say that we never will be able to explain the mental. There are Mysterians in the world. Colin again says we'll never understand consciousness. He is a new Mysterian. But I think that that is a fundamentally, methodologically flawed approach because once we take that approach, we automatically prevent ourselves from ever understanding consciousness. Maybe, as a matter of fact, we never can understand the mind, never can understand consciousness, but if we assume up front that we can't, then we guarantee that we can't. If we try and fail, that's a different case. So we want to assume we can get rid of nomological danglers to give scientific explanations and try and do such. So Smart thinks he's responded to these objections to identity theory. There are people that come along and say identity theory is not true. Why? Because if identity theory is true, mind and body have all the same properties, but there's some property of the mind not had by the body. The fact that I know it, the fact that I experience it, the fact that it has a quality to redness that's not had by the underlying brain process. He says, get rid of these. This confuses intention, extension, has to do with the way you think about it. Now skip ahead to Kripke, because Scheffler is largely concerned with the thing seeing th same issues as Smart, and he sort of falls into making the same objections that Smart already responded to. He seems to think that Smart is not fully carried his response to the objections. And that's up to you to decide. But assuming SMART has succeeded, we got rid of the Cartesian claim that mind and body have different essential properties. Say, this is the dialectic, this is the conversation that's developing about the nature of mind and body. Descartes said they have different essential properties. Let's assume we got rid of that claim. Property dualists say, well, intentionality is had by the mental and not by the physical. Well, but if the mental and physical are identical, then the brain state that underlies my mental experience of pain is about the pain. So let's assume that's been answered. Smart comes in with another group of objections that I can know the red without knowing the brain state underlying the red, that I can experience the red without experiencing the brain state that underlies it. That the red has a certain way of feeling to me that the brain state doesn't. He says that these are cases of intention not extension, get rid of them. And remember, the reason we're doing this is the mere fact that you don't know the morning star is identical to the evening star, you don't know that my fiance is the most beautiful woman in the world, does not make it so that the evening star is not the morning star, does not make it so my fiance is not the most beautiful woman in the world. Right? does not affect the thing in the world, the referent of those phrases and terms. Kripke comes in and he says he has another 
objection. And he's actually making this objection, not trying to respond to it. He does not buy identity theory. He's arguing specifically, again, against type identity theory. And the reason we're concerned with type identity theory is if we have merely token identity theory, we're not going to be able to get rid of the nomological danglers. To say that the pain I feel right now is identical to the C firing, C fiber firing I'm having right now, doesn't say anything about my ability to predict whether or not you're in pain by looking at your C fiber firing, because maybe your C fiber firing is much different than mine. Or maybe there's something different in your brain that happens when you experience seeing red than happens in my brain when I see red. Maybe in the future, my brain state when I experience red is different than my brain state now when I experience red. Categorically different. That is not just token instances, different types. That would be a big problem. To say that all we could ever say about them is that there is something that happens in my brain that's identical to my mental experience for every single mental experience that doesn't say that there's something that ties them together. They could be different type things. We want to say that they're all the same type. Regardless of the differences, there are differences in stars, some stars are bigger, some stars are smaller, and so forth, but nonetheless we can group them all together and say these things here are stars, those things there are not. And we can say certain things about stars in general, and from that we can construct laws based on stars, scientific laws that allow us to predict where stars might occur, where we might find stars we don't currently know about, explain what happened to a star, its life, etc. So that's what we're concerned with type identity theory. Kripke comes in and he says, well, look, there is a property had by the mental, not had by the physical. And his objection is rather complicated. But he says that the kind of identity that the type identity theorist is concerned with is necessary identity, not contingent identity. And then he goes on to argue against necessary identity. So first we need to understand the difference in necessary and contingent identity. As a matter of fact, my fiancé is the most beautiful woman in the world. But it could have been otherwise. Why? Because she could have turned me down, in which case she would be the most beautiful woman in the world, but not be my fiancé. It could be that she was not born and then someone else would be the most beautiful woman in the world. So you could have the referent of the most beautiful woman in the world be someone other than my fiancé. And I could have no fiancé at all. And yet, my fiancé would still be the most beautiful woman in the world. She just no longer would be referred to by the phrase Robert's fiancé. So not only could you know certain things about my fiancé and fail to know that you know that about the most beautiful woman in the world, and you could know things about the most beautiful woman in the world without realizing that you know those things about my fiancé. Those are intentional issues. They don't affect the identity of my fiancé and the most beautiful woman in the world. The phrase the most beautiful woman in the world picks out the same thing in the world as the phrase my fiancé. But it does so contingently. It depends on the specific situation at hand. The fact that my fiancé was born, if she weren't, the phrase, the most beautiful woman in the world, would pick out a different reference in the world. If my fiancé turned me down, the most beautiful woman in the world would still pick her out of the world, but the phrase, Robert's fiancé, would not. So the fact that the two phrases, most beautiful woman in the world, Robert's fiancé, pick out the same person in the world, is a contingent fact, not a necessary fact, that does not hold in all worlds. This world talk uh, is a way of talking about possibility. I won't go into that. But we can think about a possible world as a possible way this world is organized. A certain way events could have went. Events could have went differently so that the most beautiful woman in the world were not my fiancé. So that my fiancé were not the most beautiful woman in the world. Other kinds of identity, Kripke says, are necessary identity. Heat and molecular motion are necessarily identical. There could not be a case in which you had molecular motion and not have heat. Could not be a case in which you had heat and not have molecular motion. 
Maybe this is intuitive to us. Maybe this makes sense because the two terms very clearly mean the same thing. Even if there were no one in the world, molecular motion would have the same effect that it does. And those effects are things we associate with heat. So he says the identity theorists, in order to make their claims, need to say that mind and body are necessarily identical. But he says there's a problem here because they're not necessarily identical. Because even though I cannot possibly think of heat without molecular motion, hmm, I can if I don't understand molecular motion. Said that before, intentional case. Nonetheless, if I'm thinking of a thing in the world that is hot, I'm thinking of a thing in the world that has a molecular motion, regardless of whether I know it or not. There's no way that can't be true. If you have heat in the world, you have molecular motion. He says, if we think about God creating the world, God creates heat. God does not have to do a second thing to create molecular motion. God creates molecular motion. God does not have to do a second thing to create heat. However, if God created C5 or fiery in humans, Kripke says, God would have to take an additional act of creating pain, the mental experience of pain. He says, it makes sense to think that there could be C fibers and C fibers firing without mental experiences of pain. It does not make sense to think that there could be heat without molecular motion. It makes sense to think that there could be the most beautiful woman in the world without that person being my fiance. He says also we could think that there could be the mental experience of pain without C fibers firing. If this is the case, there's something true about pain, not true about body. Or rather, love. Yes. It's possible to have seed by requiring without having the mental experience of pain. We can separate those things in that way. That's a contingent identity. But if it's a contingent identity, that means there exists some possible configuration of events. God created the world differently. We're in a different possible world in which there is C-fiber firing and there is not the mental experience of pain. Or there is the mental experience of pain and there is not C-fiber firing. That means they have different properties. C-fiber firing has a certain possibility space that it inhabits a certain group of possible worlds, possible ways the world could have went, in which there is C fiber firing, in those same worlds, there is not the mental experience of pain. C fiber firing have the property of existing in that world. Pain does not have the property of existing in that world. And he says that this is important because the very idea of pain, he says, we could not say, well, but look, there's still pain because we define pain as C fiber firing. So in those possible worlds which you're C fiber firing, but you don't experience pain, you're still having pain. He says this is nonsense because the experience of pain just goes along with the idea of pain. Pain just is a certain kind of experience. There's a slogan, or there was a slogan for the painkiller dome, which is for specifically for back pain. And they had a commercial where they said that you can't stop the pain, but you can keep it from hurting. Well, this is nonsense, right? Because pain just is that experience of hurting, right? If you're not having that experience, you're not in pain. And if you are having that experience, you are in pain. No one can say, no, you're not in pain and be right about that. You can't be argued out of that. You can't be convinced you're not in pain. Even if you are experiencing pain, and someone comes along and studies you and says, look, we checked your brain, we checked your neurons, we checked your nerves, and there was no C fiber firing. Nonetheless, you're in pain because you're having the experience. Pain just is the experience. So it's not possible, he says, to think that, well, we said there was a possible way things could have went, a possible set of worlds in which there's C fiber firing, 
but not the middle experience of pain. But we're going to say that pain just is C fiber firing. He says that makes no sense. Pain just is a word that names a kind of mental experience. So now there's two big claims here. Whether he's right about this claim about pain, that pain, the word, just names a certain kind of mental event. That seems right to me. The other big issue facing Kripke is whether he's right that the identity theorist needs necessary identity, right? So the fact that there could be a situation where we have C-5 firing and not pain, that we could have a certain mental event and not the physical event that we currently associate with one another. Right now in this world, in this set of circumstances, here today, mental event M always is associated with physical event P, and neither mental event M has a property, physical event P does not, nor does physical P have a property that mental event M does not. They share all their properties in common. They're identical here right now. But if it could be the case that one of them occurs without the other, then they do have a different property. He says that the identity theorist, in order to construct laws, of nature, of science, need necessary identity. Since what we're going for is explanation of mind by way of body, we need there to be laws of science. Otherwise, we have these nomological danglers, these mental events that we cannot possibly explain. But then it seems that there's a weight on Kripke to carry this claim that the identity theorist needs necessary identity and not only contingent identity. Now, of course, the claim is that scientific laws are not supposed to hold just here and now. They're supposed to hold in general always. Without going into philosophy of science, there's certainly room to claim that that is not the case, that there are no necessary laws of science, that all laws of science are contingent. They apply only to a certain range of cases. If Kripke is right, the identity theorist does need necessary identity, and he's right that the case of pain and C fiber firing, the case of a mental event and its corresponding physical event, are identical but only contingently so, just like my fiance is identical to the most beautiful woman in the world, but it could have been otherwise. If that's the case for pain and C fiber firing, for a mental event, the experience of red and the corresponding physical event in my brain, if they could have been otherwise, if one could occur without the other, this is similar to what. Descartes was claiming, but Descartes was claiming it about the substances themselves. Mind could occur without body. Here we're saying a certain property, seeing red, could occur without the other corresponding physical property. If he's right about that, the identity is merely contingent. Even if every case we've ever experienced of red is a case of the underlying mental event, it's a contingent identity. That won't underlaw, underwrite scientific laws if we think scientific laws are and must be cases of necessity. If we can't underwrite scientific laws, then we can't come up with laws that get rid of the nomological danglers. We can't explain all of the mental by way of the physical. If that's the case, there's something that is distinctively mental. That is, on our ontology, there's going to have to be a category for the mental. And we're not going to be able to link those with laws. This is small. I'm going to make this larger. But our ontology, we say the physical. We say the mental. This is our ontology of the mind. The list of things that exist about the mind. The dualist comes along and says there's two kinds of things. There's the physical, there's the mental. Here we have the physical C fiber firing. Here we have the mental pain. Here we have uh, neurons x through xn 
firing, activated. Here we have seeing red. Now what we want to do is be able to have laws about these, about the mental events. We want to study the mind, explain the mind, predict the mind. Our sciences are physical in nature. If we can reduce these to physics, to biology, to chemistry, then we're going to be able to explain them. So what we need are laws, called bridging laws, that say, well, when C-fiber firing happens, pain happens. When C-fiber firing of a certain sort happens, pain of a certain sort happens. We need to link up certain events in the mind, certain groups of neurons acting in a certain way with certain mental events. These are our bridge laws. They bridge our two categories together. Now, if there's something over here, um, what do we want it to be? Uh, tasting. Mango. If that exists over here, and we cannot find anything in the physical, that it corresponds to. If we can't have a necessary identity here between something and tasting mango, we can't develop a law to bridge the two. If we can't do that, these are going to be nomological danglers, things we can't explain in terms of physics. They will exist as purely mental things in our ontology. Once we get bridge laws, we can mark these off and say, well, really, what these are, pain, seeing red, these are just intentional cases. They're ways of talking about C-fiber firing in neurons activated in a certain way. If we don't have a bridge law here, we can't make that move and mark these off and say that tasting mango just is an intentional way of referring to something physical in the world. No, this has to have its own status and say that, well, there is a thing, an experience of tasting mango that thing is picked out by the term tasting mango, and that does not reduce to anything physical. That is, it is itself mental. Complicated week. I'm going to post your paper tomorrow. And it's due in two weeks, I think. I will post the due date when I post the paper. Send me questions about any of this, any of this lecture, any of the readings this week, things that I assume you know that you don't know, things that I explained and did not explain well, any of those things, send me questions. It will help you. It will help me. It will help the class. Thank you.